Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. <rire> C'est toi pour Hell. Marty Kendall is an engineer, a speaker, and a writer. He's analyzed a bunch of data and built some cool free technology. He's also brought a lot of people together who are working on cutting edge practical information. He runs a group where some of the smartest people in nutrition are interacting daily, sharing information and studies and clinical experience. This includes Dr. Ted Nyman, who was my first guest and who we bring up a few times in this episode. These are not anti-car people. They aren't dogmatic. They don't let other interests or beliefs enter the picture. They're after information and truth and are working towards healing people and changing lives. They're coming at this from all sides and from all over the world. Some are doing the research, some are just interpreting it and thinking about it from new angles. Ted is in the clinic daily, putting it into practice and reversing diabetes. Marty is building tools and thinking about it from his engineering perspective. I love people who think about it this way. I'm like a broken record because I'm an engineer too. We need to stop thinking that only a doctor can be an expert on nutrition. Why would they be? They have extremely little or no nutrition-specific training. They are brilliant when it comes to a million other things, but they aren't the end-all be-all of nutrition. They can be, though. But so can an engineer who dedicates years of their life to researching a topic. Not everyone who does this will be smart or correct, but some are. These are the people I get on the podcast. Ivor Cummins, Tucker Goodrich, Gabor Adosi, Dave Feldman soon, and now Marty Kendall. There's many more as well, and I'll continue to find them. Enough of my ranting. Just a quick word on the Food Lies documentary. It's going really well and being pushed forward daily. I just booked our trip to Maryland to film with Dr. Bill Schindler. Go back to listen to that episode if you missed it. There's only about 11 days left on the Indiegogo.com crowdfunding page. Please go there to pre-order the film. There's a link in the show notes in your podcast app and on peak-human.com. You can also search for Food Lies on Indiegogo or go to foodlies.org to learn more. Now please take a listen to Marty and I talk about my favorite topic, nutrient density. All right, Marty Kendall, welcome to the podcast. You're calling in from Australia? Yeah, Brisbane. How's it going, Brian? Brisbane. Good to be here. I'm doing great, and I'm so happy to have you. We had an awesome talk the other day. And, uh, <laughs> Should have recorded that. It was a good chat. <laughs> exactly. We wouldn't have to be here right now if we just recorded that. <laughs> that was a good warm-up. And, you know, a lot of people have thrown your name around lately, and I, I never looked you up. <laughs> it's funny that we just haven't connected yet when we're so on the same page. Yeah. You're all about nutrient density. That's all I talk about. <laughs> it's just so great that I finally <laughs> thought to uh, actually track you down and look at what you've been doing and i'm Cheers, man. so impressed thank you thank yeah. you yeah I've, I've been listening to your podcast and you keep on talking about nutrient density and i think oh i think he I think he gets this and i like not many people join all the dots about how important a component of our nutrition nutrient density is and uh, yeah so it's really good to be able to have a chat Great. So you have a popular blog, you have a big Facebook group, you've kind of collected a lot of the greatest minds in nutrition actually conversing yeah, on I'm, the page, right? Yeah, I've just been privileged to make some really smart friends and continue to learn from them. And I suppose you're the average of your five smartest oh. or, well, you know, your five friends. And, you know, I've, I've had the privilege to be able to be surrounded by people through social media and Facebook groups that you learn a lot from. And yeah, I suppose way back, Rob Wolf, I listened to all his podcasts and was a little fan and a little fanboy. And, you know, now it's good to be able to, to talk to people like Ted and Rob and those sort of guys and, and, and Lewis and get to know them and learn from them and uh, be part of the conversation and give something back now too. That's so cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a great little club. And Tyler Cartwright as mm. well. So yeah, Luis from Keto mm. Games. And yeah. Ted yeah. Nyman's amazing. I see you. Yeah. Uh, you use his infographics. <laughs> which are awesome and they're always so great i, I just uh, take his infographics which are brilliant and just put you know, three thousand word articles around them so it's basically a caption to ted's uh, ted's <laughs> memes yeah well you guys complement each other well so well yeah let's way. get into it i mean you did a long article about one of his infographics Oh, about yeah, the yeah. insulin and the dam. I don't know if we should start mm. with that. Maybe we just go, let's go straight into nutrient density. Let's go sure. to the, the good stuff, <laughs> the stuff that I like, and then we'll get to that later. But uh, that's also what Ted talks about a lot. I love his message. Mm. It's, mm. it's about mm. not eating energy dense food. So tell mm. us, like, what do you define as nutrient density? And just talk about the top level for a second. 
Yeah, yeah. A lot of people talk about nutrient density. It's a bit of a term thrown around and it hasn't really been defined by many people. And a few people have tried to define it. I suppose I've got to give credit to the people who have gone before. And one of those is like Joel Furman, who has a you know a vegan um, plant-based agenda at the same time. So we dug into that and uh, that definitely has some limitations, which were unearthed by Matt Lalonde's presentation from his AHS talk in 2012. And that completely blew me away and captured my attention as well. And he sort of analysed the ones that had gone before and looked at uh, Furman's and he said, look, there's all these nutrients that he's counting that are, aren't defined for all the foods we've got and they're not essential and they're maybe you know, biasing intentionally to plant-based foods. So he took it and went, this is garbage, I'll throw it out and do my own and took all the 42 essential nutrients, including B12 and omega-3 and, and all the amino acids, which Furman hadn't done. So Lon came up with this nutrient density scale, which um, was sort of an advancement and everybody cheered because it had bacon at mm-hmm. the top and it was a very meat-heavy mm-hmm. approach. And I took that and um, I looked at that and, and read Chris Cress's book, which sort of held it up to be really good and tried to replicate that in my spreadsheet to try and smash it together with insulin load, which is another thing close to my heart. And I suppose I realized that Lalonde's approach came up with like 60 or 70% protein. And as much as I'm a fan of protein, if, if you prioritize the amino acids, you get to this very, very, very protein dense diet. Because you're prioritizing 42 essential nutrients, you're not prioritizing the things that are harder to find. So those proteins are often very easy to find. And depending on who you are, you've got different micronutrients that you're finding it harder to find. Like your vegans might find B12, omega-3, vitamin D harder to find. And your carnivores, you've got a different set of nutrients that are harder to find. So you really need to use nutrient density to zero in the, in the nutrients that you're finding challenging to get into your diet and define it based on who you are. So yeah, that's sort of what I've done. Built a system that said, who are you? What are you eating? We can even analyze your current diet, your food log based on your chronometer log and say, well, what foods will complement that to give you a a better overall micronutrient profile? Yeah. Yeah. That's where I'm at with nutrient density and definitely an important, fascinating topic. And and once you identify nutrient dense foods, they're, they're often less insulinogenic and more satiating and less energy dense and all these sort of other things. And they all sort of go hand in hand and, you know, they all sort of complement each other. So I don't know which one you hold up as the most important, but they all come together to identify good foods that we should eat more of and help cut through the confusion, I suppose. And there's so much confusion in nutrition about what we should be eating and to be able to quantify these things gives clarity that I hope will help a lot more people. Yeah. So I love your way of doing it. It's variable. No other system is mm. really variable because it's too hard to make recommendations for everyone. Yet somehow I'm trying to do that. Mm. I'm trying to see if it's yeah. possible to kind of give a yeah. general yeah. framework. But yeah, your sure. thing is that, yeah, carnivores and vegans are very different and they're lacking in different things. Mm. So that's really interesting. Mm. And yeah, I do want to go mm. back on a few things because Joel Furman, yeah, I don't agree with his way of doing it at all. And I've talked about that before. Mm. And, you know, he has, well, it seems like everyone who does a nutrient density score, they just get what they want at the top. So, you know, yeah. Furman found a way to get kale and all that stuff at the top <laughs> and how to push animal foods to the bottom. And that's by yeah. leaving out essential amino acids and omega 3s and yep. stuff like that and maybe penalize. Yeah. And some I saw penalize for saturated fat. There's also, you mentioned yeah. Chris Presser who did this a great article about nutrient density. Yeah, and yeah I read that. Really exactly. Good. And, and that's where I found Lon. Matt, you mentioned Matt Lon. He did his own version. Yeah. I guess he's some like kind of Harvard PhD type of guy who did a presentation yeah. on this. And he did his own version. And yeah, I do like his version. So you think it's a problem that he focused on these amino acids and that protein was at the top. But you also talk about all these great high protein studies and high protein diets that that work well with the satiety and stuff like that. I I suppose from a prioritization point of view, prioritization means you bring to the top the things that you want more of and you can't prioritize everything and when you prioritize everything you're effectively prioritizing Mm -hmm, nothing so to properly prioritize you have to say well i actually want more of that and if you look at your 
we do a, a micronutrient fingerprint, which looks at based on the recommended daily intakes, which you know arguable and, and variable, but um, based on that, you can say, well, I'm definitely getting enough B12 and vitamin K or vitamin A and these sort of things. So who cares about them? I don't need to focus on those. So I need to, you know, a lot of people need to get more potassium and magnesium and calcium and omega-3 and these sorts of nutrients that are typically harder to find in our current diet. Meanwhile, we're getting plenty of protein. And, and also the other thing, flip side of that is if we focus on those the vitamins and minerals that are harder to find, we always get tons of protein coming along for the ride. So basically it becomes mm. a non-issue. But at the same time, I can rant for <laughs> hours about the importance of protein. And uh, yeah. yeah, so you, you, yeah, you obviously recognize the importance of protein. And that's also a great mm. sign. Like you said, if you, you're getting a lot of micronutrients, you're probably getting a lot of protein too. And they go hand in hand. Exactly, yeah. and they're <laughs> they really do. That's the thing I found again and again and again, that a, a diet that contains plenty of micronutrients gets plenty of protein and you don't have to bicker and argue endlessly about whether you need 0.8 or 1.2 or 1.6 grams per kilogram of lean body mass or total body mass or whatever you want you know these arguments go on forever but if you just focus on those harder to find nutrients everything else just works itself out and even the plant-based versus animal-based sort of diet you know if you whatever your preference is if you focus on foods that contain more of those harder to find nutrients within your chosen preference you can uh, get a really good outcome yeah, so it sounds like you can kind of make a optimal diet if you focus on the protein, the micronutrients, the harder to find ones, the ones that we're deficient in. So mm. what is that? Maybe you don't publicly promote that one diet, but what do you think ah. that is? It seems like it's possible, right? If you use, well, okay, I think nutrient density is the best way to look at a diet because it's quantifiable. There's a way to sort of be not subjective about it. So that means you can find an optimum way to eat, right? So you're, yeah, sure. So what do you think that is? Well, I suppose the caveat there, it's always going to depend on context and preference and where you are and what season it is and what foods you've got available and what foods you can afford. So you can't just say, you know, I could say you should eat spinach and caviar and lobster and crayfish and, uh, you know, 99% of the population will go, oh, I can't afford mm-hmm. to live on that or it's not available and it's not in season. So, um, but did you mention those because those are, that would be a very ideal? Yeah, yeah. If you ask me what the most nutrient-dense, most satiating foods, those foods are going to be, you know, non-starchy green veggies as well as um, probably seafood. I tend to see that ranking at the highest. People prize caviar. It's hellishly expensive because it is Mm -hmm. nutrient-dense, I think. People talk about liver being really nutrient-dense, but at the same time, uh, you've got to caveat that with that has a ton of vitamin A and a bunch of other nutrients that are also quite easy to find. So in in the context of... um, don't penalize it. <laughs> our current base diet, you can't just say, well, I eat you know, a bit of liver once a week and therefore my diet's really nutrient dense. Uh, in with Vitamin A is quite easy to get. So uh, you can't say just because it contains a whole lot of that vitamin A or those few micronutrients that it's got a ton of, it, it's not the most nutrient dense or the only nutrient dense food that you need. So it's definitely context specific and depends on what you're currently eating. And we always change and I suppose our app Appetite is the most amazing thing because you always get a bored of a food. You can't eat the same food forever. And that's obviously a way of us making sure we continue to circulate our diet to get different foods and different nutrients. And we've got taste and smell and all these sensations, which are amazingly well optimized to seek out what we need. So, yeah. yeah um, we're just trying to mimic that function in a, in a spreadsheet that mm. uh, in a world that our food system has been so bastardized by fake flavors and colors. and Yeah, there's a fine line between getting too technical about this and mm. uh, food is fun, food is, you know, it's yeah, social. Yeah. It, it's so many things. It's not a, it shouldn't yeah. be a data table, but there no. is an art and a science to it <laughs> in a way. And definitely, definitely. You find a balance. And, and, and good food should taste good. Like if you get good meat, or good fish or good veggies it tastes good because it's got nutrients in it and nutrients typically taste good and if you've got veggies that taste like garbage then you've probably got 
garbage veggies that are old and maybe you shouldn't eat them if you don't enjoy those veggies so yeah you should go search out for food that you really enjoy and go wow this tastes amazing well that that's another good point food should be delicious and Mm. you shouldn't eat anything that's not delicious Mm. and that was mark sisson's big point that he was trying to make Mm. when i interviewed him everything you eat should be delicious and there's no reason not to and you Mm. should optimize for Mm. that and it's so amazing that that usually like you said perfectly coincides with nutrition and why it tastes good Mm. and why it's natural natural for it to taste good because Mm. this is how we've been seeking foods for all of human history is based on nutrition without knowing it or with and without knowing it there's a lot of cultures you know like you talk about fish eggs like they sought out fish eggs because they knew how nutritious they were yeah yeah. it's it's so powerful and uh yeah and i suppose in a modern food environment we've only in the last 50 years or so developed the technology to hack our food palate to to take you're talking with Tucker about seed oils and, and grains and together we mash together these cheap energy sources that are basically sucking energy out of the ground from fossil fuels, jamming them into agriculture and mixing colours and flavours into them that taste amazing and are mind-blowing, but they don't actually contain the... It's like it's like teasing your taste buds, teasing your appetite to make it taste like it's got nutrition in, but it, but it doesn't. And I suppose that's where these days we need some modern technology to cut through that and to say, well, you know, it's dressing up as if it's got nutrition in it it tastes like it's got you know it tastes amazing tastes mind-blowing but it's not because it's just the colors and flavorings that are faking that nutrition and yeah so i think we need to combat technology with technology to an extent in this environment and that's why nutrition nutrient density becomes important because in the olden days you'd be walking along and hunting and gathering and everything you was attached to the ground would have heaps of nutrients in Mm -hmm. it but yeah today that's not the case Exactly. It sounds like you're talking about the Dorito Effect, which is a book that you just recommended to me the other yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, a yeah, really fantastic book. Uh, it chronicles the development of agriculture, I suppose, when um, back in the 60s, they started to have more advanced farming techniques and we grew things more quickly and more cheaply and the chickens got bigger and the grains got grew more quickly and we got a whole lot more fuel and energy and in our diet but then things started to taste less amazing and the chickens just didn't taste how they used to and it's a fascinating story of uh what makes flavor and what makes nutrition what makes taste in our food and um and how i suppose we've made up for the lack of nutrition in our food with fake colorings and flavorings that make it taste nutritious again yeah it's just it's like a trick it's tricking our <laughs> our bodies and it's making us eat more and a lot of people think that's totally. the main cause of obesity you can say a million things but really it's that we're eating too much because food is everywhere it's delicious it's mm. not as nutrient dense we've replaced nutrients with fake flavors and they're all related factors but um yeah there's a lot of them but they're all they're all come back to eat real food and uh, yeah, nutrient density is a quantitative way to identify foods that actually contain actual nutrients rather than uh, you might be able to fortify with a couple of nutrients but uh, an actual full nutrient spectrum profile of essential amino acids and, and vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids you're probably going to get all the other things that are beneficial in our food system as well so we can't just throw a supplement or a cocktail uh, a soylent sort of uh, you know, <laughs> effect. We, we need real food that contains a full spectrum of nutrition. Yeah, it sounds like it's some like hippie thing that people say, but it. I mean, it's just it's just real, you know. It's yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, as I said, I was totally captivated by that Matt Lalonde presentation. Went, wow, this is the real way to. Because um, I initially uh, went digging into the insulin load to try and optimize my wife's diet for type one diabetes and flatline her blood sugars, and uh, and I went, oh wait up, oh, a really low insulin diet is just you know processed fat and it is living on butter and olive oil and bacon mm-hmm. and peanut butter alone going to be an optimum nutrient profile? And from my paleo headspace i thought oh probably not and then the matt lalonde presentation came along and i thought maybe there's a way of blending those two together to help with diabetes management if you need to but also to maximize the the nutrient content of your food at the same time yeah yeah let's get back to the diabetes thing in a second what are the 10 most nutrient dense foods we're not going to give someone yeah you said (laughs) you know i'll tell you just what i think and you tell me based on all your research but 
you can't make an ideal diet, but maybe we can go to 20 foods across all the different foods. Just start yeah, listing wow. some. This doesn't have, this is not a quiz <laughs> and yeah, no one's yeah, going to hold you to it. <laughs> it's like, oh no, he's wrong. That was like number six. And he yeah, said it was number one. No, no, just, no. And, and that's the thing. It all depends on your context. But yeah, I mean, the spinach, the non-starchy green vegetables, the broccoli, and uh, but, but then at the same time, people protest and say, you know, that some of those nutrients aren't as bio, bioavailable from plant-based yeah. versus animal-based. And they're right to an extent but at the same time the plant-based foods tend to have more per calorie but then if you wanted to jump in and look at animal-based foods or seafood based foods you know you, you, you're uh, typically if you're looking for nutrients in a f- if your priority is nutrient density then you don't want the really 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 fatty cuts because the fat doesn't contain a lot of nutrients per calorie so you know you want mm-hmm. potentially the leaner meats maybe the seafood seafood's amazing just contains a whole profile of potassium magnesium sodium and iodine and omega-3 and B12 and all the things that are really hard to get. And I think you know, from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, we evolved from sea creatures originally is, is the theory and, and therefore our whole metabolism, our sodium potassium pump is all bound up in those minerals being critical to driving our metabolism. So those things just seem to be plentiful in those in, in those seafood type foods and sea vegetables, your, your, uh, your seaweed and, and those sorts of things are just really chopped full of Mm -hmm. nutrients and then as you you'd go for animal foods and i suppose to an extent your beef is not going to be if your beef is fed on processed grains it's not going to be able to you are what you ate ate in a way so it depends on what they're eating and i know you've you're all across that and if you the whole dynamic of 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 the land working with the farming practices and that all working Mm -hmm, together in synergy is an amazing thing so if, if you're eating happy healthy animals you're going to be doing a whole lot better as well so yeah, and then the least nutrient dense foods would be the grains and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the number one thing that I think most people can agree on is those processed grains are very low nutrient density and low satiety. So that they're cheap, cheapest thing in the world to feed your family processed vegetable oils and sugars and flour. But and that's basically what makes up all the foods in a supermarket. But it's also very nutrient poor and very low satiety, and probably going to drive you to overeat. It's dog food. It's human, it's human dog food. I am posted about this, but I, I'm not joking. Like it's exactly the same. I'm not making some sort of joke. That's what it is. It's just, it's created for long shelf life, yep. for maximum profit for the manufacturer. Everything about it is bad. Your health is not their priority. Not at all. And well, I said that dog food is better actually because at least dog food is formulated for the dog's nutrition in mind. Mm. And mm. you know, most of the foods are formulated for you to buy more and eat more. You know, some Mm. of them are like, you know, they have some fortified cereals or something, you know, with some nutrition in mind. But most of it is just how can we get people to eat more of this? Totally. So, okay. So we got the the most nutrient dense foods. If you just want to eat a good diet, you'd be eating seafood, shellfish, mollusks, Mm. clams, oysters, fatty fish, salmon. You'd be eating, you know, well-raised animal products. Definitely. You'd be eating the whole animal, ideally, <laughs> different mm, parts of the def- animal, but, you know. Definitely, ideally, nose to tail. Nose and to tail. All, all, all the collagen and yeah. glycine, they're all critical nutrients that you need in your, in your nutrient profile if you can get them. Absolutely. You'd be eating dark Definitely leaf eggs. Leaf. Eggs are just eggs, amazing. Eggs. The yolk is just full of so many nutrients and choline that is really hard to get elsewhere. Exactly. So it makes a whole animal. So mm. it should have a lot for of sure. nutrients in it. For sure. Eggs for sure. Fish, eggs, leafy greens. So we have marine greens, mm. leafy greens, spinach, stuff like that. Definitely. Nuts, seeds. Uh, are those up yeah. there? Uh, I suppose they're, they're great, but they tend to be more energy dense. So yeah. the, the, the nutrients per calorie, I know that's arguable, but um, a lot of people look at it from nutrients per gram. But, you know, nutrients per calorie, most people eat about 2,000, 3,000 calories a day to maintain weight and they will change weight if they manipulate the calories so i think you've got to consider it in terms of calories and, and those energy dense nuts can be easier to over consume but but then again if you're an athlete and weight stable and want to gain more weight or replenish your energy they're a fantastic option yeah yeah i yeah a lot of things you can get carried away with so the whole goal of maintaining weight or losing weight is controlling your appetite and not overeating then you don't want to get in trouble mm. with things like nuts that you could easily overeat Mm. Right. Yeah, a lot, lot of people, if they're trying to lose weight, tend to stall on dairy and nuts, which can be easy to overeat. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about satiety. That's so important. Mm. <laughs> That's all that really matters, yeah. I think. When, it's, when, but when it's all connected. Talk- it's like, how are you going to eat less? 
you know, saying, oh, just eat less. <laughs> That's how you're going to lose weight. Well, how? <laughs> how am I going to do that? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And then we're, we're all told to exercise and eat less. And it's like, well, you know, every time you find yourself in a dark moment with your favorite comfort food, you know, late at night, it's all over and your reptilian brain wins and you end up consuming it till it's gone. So, yeah. So, yeah, you did a lot of study on satiety and you looked at mm. 587,000 days worth of data <laughs> from <laughs> yeah. my fitness pal. Just right. Fun. It was publicly available and did a bunch of calculations. He wrote a long article about this calculating Mm. so yeah Mm. talk about that yeah i I just think satiety is where it's at and we've looked at insulin and got consumed with you know i I went down that track as well and i know ted and a bunch of other people looked and went insulin carbs are the boogeyman but um and we all need to just eat less insulinogenic food which is low carb and high fat and then all these people in the ketogenic community are practicing it as hard as they can and i know i fell for it as well all of a sudden you look in the mirror and go wow i don't look that Mm -hmm. flash and this isn't working for me so this low carb high fat ketogenic prioritize the fat thing doesn't work so there must be another way it can't be just the insulin um i suppose from my perspective looking at uh, my wife's blood sugars and we've got a closed loop um, insulin pump system and the insulin goes up when she eats food and then you know carbs go up quicker and protein goes up over a longer period and then fat goes up to some extent but then after eight or ten hours once she's digested that food you see the pump start to switch off the insulin dose and adjust her insulin down and then i went oh wow really it's a you know you you need to find out what foods will help you to eat less so your insulin comes down and when the insulin comes down it, it allows the glucagon goes up and it allows all your body fat to be released for energy to fill that deficit really so you know insulin just controls the amount of energy flowing in and out of your storage so you know the basic bottom line is that we need to find a way to eat less without our cravings and our appetite overriding that so yeah we um there was a bunch of work done by Susanna holt back in 1995 where they looked at all the different foods 38 different foods in a laboratory setting and found that energy density helps to uh, foods that have a low en- low energy density lead us to eat less and high fiber foods and high protein foods and then for fat starch and sugar the sort of this optimum point where you mix them together with um, carbs and fat together you get a maximum calorie intake so we thought no that's really interesting but it doesn't give us a lot of resolution a lot of confidence it's only 38 data points and it's never really taken off but yeah we came across this half million data points and basically replicated that and then formularized it with a lot more resolution so we can then plot satiety the foods that are more satiating and help you to rank those foods and hopefully developed a little app called the Never Hungry Diet so people can go through the shopping center and say, well, this time I'm not going to buy anything that's got a satiety ranking of less than 40%. And, um, and it'll help you eliminate those hyperpalatable foods that are really easy to overeat. And then hopefully people will continue to ratchet that up and that'll help them dial in their satiety and feel fuller for longer without having to exercise this willpower that, you know, if you're always fighting your reptilian instincts, you're always going to lose in the long run. Yeah, yeah, I like that. The practical application of that is to go to the store and just don't buy mm. things that are going <laughs> to make you keep eating. Don't put and- it in your trolley. Yeah, and the, and the bottom line of all that, I think if you just pick up a food and it's got some form of flour added to some form of vegetable oil with a bunch of fake flavors and colors, you should just put it down and walk away quietly and look for something else. Yeah, well, that's yeah. that's a nightmare. Yeah, that's the worst combination. So, yeah, one of the findings totally. that everyone can kind of agree on mm. in, in every kind of nutrition approach is that the mm. killer combo is the fat plus the carbs that yeah. refined, especially refined fat and refined carbs together is it just hyper palatable yeah i i, I plotted because we can pull out all the different factors that influence your satiety and when i plotted starch plus fat it was like wow this is just you've got no chance of not overeating if a majority of your diet is coming from that combination and all your willpower all your calorie tracking all that time invested is is wasted because you're not going to be able to override your appetite if your food is coming from those foods it's like it seems like it's the signature for autumnal foods a guy um sian foley in Mm, ireland has got this fantastic blog and book don't eat for winter yeah and um i just went oh wow you've really come across some interesting insights where he points out that 
in autumn you get acorns and, and you get human breast milk and these sort of foods are very unique that they provide both carbs and fat together and it's like the signature food that sends your appetite into overdrive and you get more hungry and all the hormones work together to fatten you for winter so you can survive the coming winter but you know you've got examples of squirrels you know autumn has gone on a bit too long and the acorns have been around for longer and it's been a bit hotter than it usually is for longer and the poor little squirrels get fat and obese and mm-hmm. diabetic and sick and when you look at what's happening in a western society it's the same thing and, and the, the processed carbs and vegetable oils added together are just you know we're, we're getting a more and more we're trending towards a similar percentage yeah. of carbs and fats together and we're, we're just suckers to it it's just programmed in our dna that that is the signature for eat 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 and don't stop till you until you pop basically yeah. and the, the food crazy. manufacturers seem to have nailed it Oh, yeah, they know what they're doing. And yeah, America's ratios are about 46% carb, 42% fat, and 12% protein or something like that. So it's totally it's a recipe for fatness. And we just optimize naturally left to our own devices. The humans optimize given those available foods to maximize calorie intake. It's incredible when you look at the data. We just completely nail it to eat the most energy we can so left to our own devices in this food environment we're, we're helpless well yeah and so the breast milk and the acorns are the only two foods in nature that have that combo of fat totally, and carbs yeah. nothing else no natural food has that and also those are specifically made in nature for growth phase it's like this is yep. how you get fat yes this baby <clears throat> wants to get fat these squirrels need to get fat for winter totally Totally. It's incredible. Yeah. And that's been a real revelation for me. And then to be able to formularize that has has been really interesting. So, yeah. Well, there's another graph that looks at that too, that Ted Nyman posted and you talked about is the satiety. Do you know which one I'm talking about? The satiety graph where four quadrant type of graph and it looks at the highest ad libitum energy intake compared to the lowest. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's from the protein leverage hypothesis paper. Ted's really sold out to the concept of the protein leverage hypothesis, which is really uh, the idea that the body continues to consume enough energy till it gets the protein it needs to survive. And I I think that's That seems to bear itself out in in my number crunching as well. But I think at the same time, I think there's a nutrient leverage hypothesis at the Mm -hmm. same time. that I think we continue to crave food until we get the salt and potassium and magnesium and calcium and phosphorus and selenium and all these things that have decreased in our diet over the last 50 years since the advent of big agriculture production and lots of energy but not a lot of nutrition from the crops that just get grown in the same plot of soil year after year after year with only chemical fertilizers and a few additional nutrients thrown in. Yeah, you also have graphs of showing the potassium, sodium, mm. and magnesium, vitamin A, yeah. vitamin B12, all going down as we totally. got obese. And yeah, a lot of that yep. is due to the soils being depleted of that. Yeah, that's all just the USDA um, economic research service data that I downloaded and plotted, you know, these things you do yeah. in your spare time when you're bored. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm like, oh, wow, this is really profound that the USDA's own data shows that over the last 100 years, those critical nutrients are, are being depleted. And it seems to be a couple of milestones. One is when big agriculture really kicked in and um, Earl Butt said, you know, go big or go home or get out and uh, said you have to plant your entire farm and you know those subsidies we used to give you for letting your crops rest for a period but we're going to scrap that and just if you can't farm your entire plot 12 months a year or for as much as you can then you're basically out of business so it radically changed agriculture and it just seems to have had a flow-on effect to the amount of minerals particularly in the soil Mm -hmm. and then the other milestone seems to be when the dietary guidelines for america came out in 1977 which was i was one great time to be born you know and at that point it seems that the vitamin b12 and the vitamin a started to drop in our diet and the protein as well as we started to avoid animal foods which then you get a decrease in animal foods saturated fat cholesterol was feared and 
we have a flow on effect and people are eating less vitamin B12 and vitamin A and, and zinc and probably selenium and all these other nutrients that are critical to us thriving. It's crazy. And yeah, I yeah, I talk about this before with other guests, but the mixed farming methods is what we need to do because the mm. animals put yeah. put all these nutrients back in the soil. It's crazy that we're just totally. separating them and all the plants do is take from the soil. And mm. yeah, we try to get it back in with some chemical fossil fuel fertilizers, but it doesn't work. We just need to do the mixed farming methods that we were doing yeah. before previously. Yeah. And also, and, and it's not, not easy with 7 billion people on the earth, but the reality is we're just eating oil, yeah. eating the fossil fuels that we're injecting into our soil via fertilizer and then feeding them to our animals and our animals are getting fat and we, yeah. And we're just getting fat from doing that. It's gross. <laughs> it's we make it, it's mm. gross. We're just eating oil. <laughs> yeah. I don't like to think about it that way. So that's, that's <laughs> another good reason why you should be eating uh, better well-sourced foods and whole foods. <laughs> but yeah, it's and hard. that won't go on for either, forever either. That'll, that'll end eventually. Yeah. Well, I looked up this little graph chart thing, and it shows the two ends of the energy spectrum of eating. So ad libitum, meaning, you know, people eat as much as they mm. want. And the highest intake, Highest energy intake was when protein was 10%, fat was 40%, carbohydrates 50%. So that's a donut, mm. right? That's a mm. donut. That's and then totally, the lowest totally. the lowest intake was protein 50%, fat 40%, carbohydrate 10%. So yeah, that's was, sort of just some meat and yeah. vegetables. Yeah, or it's effectively a protein spring modified fast where you prioritize protein and just say, you know, if I can get 40 or 50 or 60% of my energy from protein, then... Who cares how much fat and carbs I'm getting? Because the, the body sort of effectively, like in, in the talk on the weekend, I'm talking about our different fuel tanks and the body will take in enough protein and then the, it has to burn off any excess protein. It's really energy inefficient. It's really difficult to convert that protein to glucose to go into ATP to fuel your mitochondria. It's a real, you can do it. Gluconeogenesis is a thing. Mm -hmm does happen but it's really hard to do and you lose about 25 percent of the energy from protein converting it to atp so the body really goes hey you know i've got enough protein can you please give me some carbs or fat which are much better energy sources and um and a modern food system just says well how about we give you carbs and fat together, together. and the body goes, well, wow it's autumn this is great let's just uh -huh. winter must be coming let's fuel up and well, we we just go nuts and we can't stop once we pop we can't stop and then we're you know you look in the mirror and go wow what happened yeah and so that's the protein at the thermogenic effect of food is interesting mm. is that protein has there there actually is something to it like protein is totally. important for your body right it's a building blocks your body there's these essential mm. things and that's why a protein totally. sparing modified fast is the best and fastest way to lose weight because you're not going to lose mm. your own body mass so you're getting adequate protein mm. but you're not mm. getting much other energy source whether it's fat or carbs and then you can mm. use your own fat for your fuel source yep. so yep. and yeah. it's def definitely not easy because your body your appetite says give me that cookie yeah. man i really need it's hard give, give me the cream i don't want another chicken breast i don't want like i i like kangaroo and um you know you get you get full you get satiated but then if you've been working out or whatever then you, your body really craves the more energy dense carbon fat but if you only give it that then it forces you to use your body fat which is what you want if you're trying to lose weight yeah so yeah it's not easy but it is the most effective and fastest mm. way to lose weight so yeah totally and as you said without losing your body fat and i think um mass yeah body mass you know, yeah without losing your lean body mass but um i think at the same time i think there's models with you know summer would have been more gatherer side of the hunter gatherer mm -hmm. spectrum and in, in the temperate environment and if you look at satiety when you push carbs way above 60 70 percent it's really hard to overeat those foods so i think there is a profile that you can exist okay on with a very high carb profile but mm -hmm. there seems to be this magic zone when you get out of that hyperpalatal middle zone to the like 20 or 30 percent carbs where you get into a endogenous ketones of the fat you're burning is from your own body fat and the ketones rise and that's a really nice place to be but it seems once you push carbs really really low you get more of an energy dense diet it is possible to overeat so that was an interesting observation from the recent um, number crunching that uh, you know that there's sort of a sweet spot for carbs it seems and uh, either side mm -hmm. of that middle hyperpalatable zone 
Yeah, that's why I don't say there's one way to do things or that mm. low carb is the only way to go and the unifying theory, right? It's just don't overeat your fuel source and pick one way or the other. Yeah. Don't be in the middle. You know, Denise Minger talks about that, the different yeah. like Simone in Bolivia. Yeah, the Okinawans. Yeah, they're eating a lot of carb. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, in your data, I know, and with that old Holt data was mm. the plain baked potato was the most satiating yeah. food, which was interesting to me. I thought it would have been just meat, you know, like a pure protein, like chicken breast type of thing. But it was, yeah, the high carb yeah, yeah, without yeah. the fat is pretty hard. That's why there's a the potato hack diet. Yeah, and, and in the vegan community, that that's going off and he's a hero. Um, he's like, they all love him and a lot of people are following that. And it's probably going to work if uh, like the, the most satiating food was the cooked and cooled potato and then reheated in the microwave the next day. And it sounds like the most unappetizing thing and it probably is but it's not just you can't eat much of it it's also filling later on with that halt data they measured their satiety perceived satiety every 15 minutes and three hours later gave them a buffet so obviously something at that point they're going no i'm still full Mm -hmm. maybe it's the resistant starch from the cooked well yeah they cooked or or something's going on there it's fascinating but um yeah another rabbit hole to look at oh i didn't know it was a cooked and cooled because i know that's how you get the resistant starch but i didn't know that that's is that how the potato hack works or do you just eat the regular uh, baked potato yeah I'm, I'm past on the potato hack i'm not a guru in that oh. area but i imagine a, a potato only diet is going to be you get bored of it as well with it. Well, exactly well i think it's terrible yeah i think it it can work but you're not getting the protein like i don't like these yeah, these you, hacks where you're like a juice fast at the end of a juice fast you're just addicted to sugar and you've lost your own body mass because you didn't get any protein yeah yeah, yeah I've, I know friends who have done a juice type fast and then they're just, you know, ravenous and they gain it all back quite quickly because you've got to find a sustainable diet you enjoy that has all the full nutrient profile that you need. Yeah, which is this nutrient dense diet we talk, we talk about. <laughs> I like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. So I was just thinking what happened to me. It took a while, but I found a way to just naturally eat a nutrient dense diet without trying Mm. and without counting calories or counting anything. Mm. But so, Mm. and it seems easy to me now, but I can't just assume everyone can do it. But I think that's Mm. a good goal for people to get to that point. Could take a while, but where Mm. if you just are eating those foods we listed, the most nutrient dense Mm -hmm. foods, after a while, you stop craving sugar, I think. And you Mm -hmm. don't have to count calories, I think. And you can just be full and not really worry about Mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yeah, definitely. Um, I suppose if it's funny if I sometimes slip up or have a cookie at work because I'm hungry or whatever, and it just seems to drive that overeating more, which is fascinating. It it just seems that once you tell your body that that food's in the environment, you go into this, let's get more of that, please. But the other thing is, I think for some people that counting the tracking, whether it be tracking calories or macros or micronutrients, I think that can be a really good training ground, training wheels, I think, to, to go through that process. For some people, they need it to get to the point where they can take off the training wheels. But in this environment, you need that training wheel to get through that dark patch until you don't crave that anymore. And the learning, yes, the learning curve. That's why I I mentioned that it took me a while and that Mm. I do it now that I've learned all this and trained myself, you know, gradually gotten more and more Mm. down this path. But yes, Mm. I think that you need to track it all in the beginning probably and be mindful of it. It's really helpful. Even just tracking anything, well, you're more mindful of it and learning about the foods. And then you just naturally know what to eat and you don't have to check some, you know, app to tell you what's nutrient dense. You just know. Because you hate those foods and they don't go in your trolley because you despise them and you you just don't like it anymore after you've been through that process but it takes a while to to break that addiction and form new positive habits and my my nutrient optimizer partner alex is really big into neuroscience as well as being a a programmer and he's designed into the nutrient optimizer app sort of a we've built nearly 300 different missions which build habits Mm. Um, that take you through and you know here's habit number one we want you to build which is really foundational which is trying to identify more of those nutrient dense foods for you and go buy them and then build nutrient dense meals and then we just continue to build new habits a little bit by little bit i think we've all had knowledge and there's a lot of people out there with a lot of knowledge but actually putting that into action with habits is the final frontier in a way that's a really a challenge like i found it in my life that you can learn a whole lot but to actually put it into practice and do it and build that habit is the really hard bit 
Yeah. Practical tips are really good. And I like the gamification aspect of it. Mm. I come, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I have like kind of a tech background and that's such a hot term, but it really works. You know, you're trying to get people to make it into a game and that yeah. affects user behavior and it, it's really works. Totally, totally. Yeah. People really want to be on the top of the leaderboard or, or, you know, not lose points for not tracking each day. And, and that helps we can use technology to build positive habits rather than just, you know, being addicted to the dopamine hit of checking a Facebook feed every minute. Yeah, totally agree. So also in the graphs that you did or the data crunching, mm. I saw watercress and stuff like that as the top yeah. of satiety. But, and that was really weird to me. <laughs> so yeah. well, for I, one, how many, no. how many calories did you last eat of watercress? You know, you don't sit down and go. That's what I was going to say. Calories of watercress. <laughs> so yeah, like it's not very practical in a way. <laughs> no. But it just appears to be that by the data. Yeah, oh, that, that's just the clean number crunching. It's unaltered. And I mean, the reality is that you're never going to live on only watercress but uh, you know if you added more of those sort of non-starchy veggies and the watercress and asparagus are, and spinach are the extreme examples of that but those sort of foods will fill you up more per calorie but the reality is you're going to need more energy dense foods to help you to survive so you, yeah well, you waste away if you're only at watercress is the bottom line which is what you want to an extent but not too much. So that's also another little problem I had with Matt Lalonde's version is he had herbs and spices near the very top and cacao near the very top. And so, mm. so what is that? People need to just sit there and eat cacao and herbs all day. You know, it's like <laughs> I, I want to build a practical version of this. Yeah, sure, sure. So I don't know if yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to do. What I have been doing actually, and I want to present yeah. it in the film. And because, mm. like you said, practical knowledge, practical stuff that works. And if we could come up with, maybe you can help me work on this uh, <laughs> offline, that I want an array of foods from the best to the worst based on mm. maybe you have to throw in a variable of portion size, reasonable portion size, where yeah, like yeah. herb, you're not, you're never going to eat more than a, you yeah. know, a teaspoon of an herb. So yeah, totally. we need to account for that. And then, you know, what do you think that would look like? I mean, I, th I think it would look like what we already mentioned, the seafood yeah, totally. and animal foods. Yeah, and I, I suppose that, that, that's where I don't get too caught up. You know, people get caught up in you know, plant versus animals. And I just say, well, here's the top animal-based foods. Here's your top seafoods. Here's your top herbs and spices. Here's your top vegetables. Here's your top fruits. And I don't really care whether you eat more of one of those groups than another if you want to fill up in herbs and uh, you know chard and watercress then go your hardest if you want to choose the most nutrient dense animal based foods which are probably also going to be more energy dense and we'll naturally select between those groups based on our appetite mm -hmm. i suppose so i just don't see a lot of need to that comes down to personal preference and and you naturally go well like i just can't eat more broccoli today yeah. or some days you might go yeah i want more broccoli and I'll, i'm gonna eat three heads of broccoli you know it depends who you are and what your preferences are and what your beliefs and what your culture is but i think you can identify nutrient dense foods within each of those categories yeah i i am developing that kind of chart too <laughs> just yeah just here's all the categories here's the top pick from these mm, mm. and know what the bottom the bottom is too mm. so and the bottom line is, it, you know, I think with a carnivore especially, you know, you, you're eliminating those nutrient-dense foods that may not be as bioavailable. But the big thing you're doing with the carnivore approach is eliminating all the processed crap foods that are yes. insulinogenic and poor nutrient density and trigger the immune system in our current environment. So that can be a powerful intervention for many. Probably the caveat that it's, I don't think it's for everybody, but for some people, it, I think it works really well. Well, yeah, why not? I mean, I try it here and there and I know it works for a lot of people. The only thing I'd say is eat more nose to tail. People always say, oh, you know, our ancestors did this. Yeah, they ate the whole animal, though. They didn't just eat yeah. the muscle meat. They were eating yeah, the, yeah. yeah, like you said, all these good connective tissues and collagen mm. and whatnot. So Yeah, when they ate the woolly mammoth, they had to go hunt it down for two days and then divvy it up and eat the whole thing nose to tail. They didn't just go to the, the supermarket and eat a whole lot of butter in their bullet coffee and keep on chowing down the cream and cream cheese and you can't just use that as a justification for in the past we ate more fat and therefore i'm obese and i should just eat fat to become like the hunter gatherers it just doesn't you've got to think of the context and who you are and if you're an athlete then that energy dense approach can be great if you're not and you need to lose the weight then there's some body fat to burn as well so that all comes into the the approach 
Yeah. Now, here's an interesting one. I, I like to ask people, smart doctors and people like you, when I run into them at maybe a conference or something, what do you think is going on with the jaw development and teeth and all that oh, Weston wow. A. Price stuff? How did these people eating their native diets get actual development of the jaw? That's like a big thing, right? Mm. It's not just a small little effect. It's like you're actually t- changing the structure of your bones and your mm. your dental arches and your teeth. So mm. I think it's just that nutrient density that you're eating so many nutrients compared to yeah. our diet. It's surprising when you actually you know do some calculations that I did mm. it was like without going back over. Mm. One diet was, American diet was like 2,500 units of nutrients mm. and a more nutrient dense was like 16,500 that I would mm. eat. And then our ancestors probably ate, you know, 25,000 mm. units. Totally. So do you think that's it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, nutrient dense whole food just uh, that, that was recently attached to the earth, I think is the bottom line. And um, I can't speak exactly on, you know, the, the, the function of the jaw and how that develops. But I um, just a couple of weeks ago came back from a holiday in Vanuatu, a couple of hours northeast of Australia, this little amazing island and uh, was there four years ago and went back again. And that the food, it's this volcanic soil and the food mm-hmm. is incredible and everything just tastes amazing. And you go, mm-hmm. well, there's something different about this. And all the, the locals bring their food down to the markets and sell it off. And uh, and then they take that money to the, the shop next door and buy Oreos and, mm. uh, and oil and flour to take back to the village. And you can see these people who in the last 10, 20 years have stumbled across this Western food that's incredibly cheap. They can no longer afford to buy their own local produce because the resorts are buying it and the Chinese and everybody else in the world is coming in and buying up the land so they can't farm their own local food anymore and and they can afford this you know that the poor poor is 200 var two and the, the the packet of oreos is 20 var two an order of magnitude cheaper in their backyard so mm. the health minister is saying to these mummers that are bringing their food for sale don't buy the stuff from the supermarket and take it back to your family because they're all getting diabetes and you know gary feck he goes over there on a regular basis to amputate limbs from the exploding diabetes epidemic and these people who live further away from port villa from the city where they can't get access to it they look fantastic they're teeth are huge and their smiles are amazing and you go i want to look like you you Mm -hmm. look fantastic and i'm just so jealous and i want to be here and i want to live here and this is amazing and then you go to the capital and these people same people same genes after a very small amount of time they change they change dramatically it's western a price in fast forward and it's just Mm -hmm. To see it up, up close, it's mind blowing, and yeah, that, that, and that's uh, really what's happening with in fast forward in our entire Western food system. But um, yeah, it's just awful that we're choosing to eat cheap, hyper palatable junk. That it, it is cheap, but it's, it's yummy. But um, yeah, not it's expensive do, for your do, body's <laughs> yeah, the, the long term cost. Yeah, and and it's in my day job. I also get involved in you know, cycling and getting people on bikes and building bike paths and designing bike paths and you know the, looking at the economic cost of obesity and diabetes. It's going to bankrupt our Western civilization in the foreseeable future. It's we can't afford the hospital costs of us eating this cheap food. And even beyond Western price, that was the thirties when we invented agriculture, our whole bodies and brains got smaller mm. just by mm. going away from nutrient dense foods. Mm. And you know, it's easy to see in the skeletal remains of someone who was mm. pre agriculture or post agriculture. So mm. it, it's a big deal. Basically, people just think it's that big a deal. But it's a daily choice to eat something that adds up to a big deal. Mm. And yeah, that's why I talk about it like every episode. <laughs> And uh, I was just thinking of some other ideas of why the jaws don't develop as well. And I was talking with Dr. Andreas Einfeld, great guy behind dietdoctor.com, really respect his opinion. And he had some interesting ideas about by not eating those grains and sugars, that the hormone response was better. It's like you were avoiding bad things for one thing, Mm. right? You were getting good hormone response and while you're growing and just mechanical processes, more Mm. like the actual chewing of the meat or breastfeeding for longer, the actual. So yeah, that was kind of interesting to me, but it's probably both, but it seems like nutrient density is very important. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, protein and calcium and all the other minerals are just critical to building good bone structure and to be tall and have good teeth and to have good jaw structure. But going back to Vanuatu, you see the guys over there and they'll actually, they show you how they used to husk the coconut. So they've got a coconut and they take the husk off it to get the coconut water out of it and they're doing it with their teeth. And that's mm. it's a massive task. It not only cleans their teeth, but also just builds muscle in and strength in the jaw. And you know, it's like resistance training for your job <laughs> that's cool Big, biggest and best and most amazing teeth and smiles you know wow <laughs> whatever they're doing the people who are living in the village who are fishing out of the water not the ones who are living in the same village eating oreos and it's like wow this is mind-blowing that you have these two dichotomies that are right next door to each other one day I'll, i want to see that in person mm. Yeah, yeah, see it before it's gone. And that's the mind blowing thing. You're just going, well, this is not going to be around for long. These people are not going to be untouched anywhere by Western civilization. We're not going to be able to go, there's a living human who is untouched by modern food and agriculture. Yeah, that's sad. So earlier we mentioned the infographic about the dam and the insulin explanation. Mm. So I don't know if this is getting too in the weeds for some people, but there's two <laughs> theories of diabetes or obesity or diabetes. Mm. One is the carbohydrate mm. insulin model and one is the adipocentric model. And I feel like a lot mm. of people, including me, and I think Ted Nyman used to be on board with the carbohydrate yeah. insulin one, right? It, it was kind of accepted that it's like you eat these insulinogenic foods with a lot of sugar and then you get type 2 diabetes, but there's more to it, right? And there's more going on. Mm -hmm. And I think you discovered stuff mm -hmm. with your wife's type 1 diabetes. Yeah. So try to explain that. We don't have the visual in front of us, but <laughs> explain the insulin dam model, the analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I suppose the, the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis to describe that is that if you inject more insulin or if you have more insulin from your food, right, secreted by your food, you'll become fat. So basically, you know, more carbs equals more body fat. And Gary Taubes and everybody's been trying to prove that for quite a while. And uh, I suppose a lot of us, myself included, have been along that journey and um, hoped that by eating more butter and bacon and olive oil and everything that you'd shed fat. But what you see living with a type 1 diabetic, they've got what they call basal and bolus insulin. So the bolus insulin is for the food you eat. So when you eat food, it helps it um, metabolize and go into your body. But then there's a, a basal insulin that you have to take all the time to stop your body disintegrating. And basically the insulin is what, in a way, holds back the floodgates of your own energy system um, leaching into your blood in an uncontrolled manner. So insulin is effectively the break on your liver that's the dam that stops glute yeah and and that's the dam that's the you know and, and the more body fat you have the more insulin you need from your pancreas to keep on producing more and more insulin to hold that body fat in storage so while you do have an insulin response to the food you eat the other side of insulin is the more body fat you've got to hold back while you're consuming food and energy from your mouth the more insulin you need. So you see people who are might be ketogenic but they're obese have very high fasting insulin levels because they've just got a lot of body fat to hold back. And really the solution to lowering your overall insulin level is to eat less and find a way to eat less. So then the, um, definitely for people who are diabetic, you want a stable blood sugar and that helps you to not overdose insulin because a lot of the time we, if you're injecting insulin, you mismatch your insulin dosing to your carbohydrate and then you go low and then you're eating to get out of that low and you're probably eating sugar or something you probably wouldn't choose to otherwise eat. But if, if you're a normal person not injecting insulin, then you need to find a way to reduce the amount you're eating to reduce, to manage your appetite, to reduce your insulin levels that are just holding back that floodgate of your own body fat stores flowing into your bloodstream. Because when you're an uncontrolled type 1 diabetic before they get insulin is just leaching all their protein and their body fat into the bloodstream. They've got high blood sugars, high blood ketones, massively elevated blood cholesterol, and um, you've got a massive total energy in your in your bloodstream, like the total level of energy from all sources is really elevated. So, you know, to reverse that, an optimally metabolically healthy person has a, a lower level and just enough to get by. And when they need it, they can easily pull it from their, their fat stores to supply the energy they need. But um, yeah, the bottom line is 
controlling your appetite with satiating foods is going to be a much better focus than trying to minimize protein and minimize all carbohydrates and just loading up on fat when you're hungry fat to satiety they say you know it's effectively an oxymoron that uh, you know fat <laughs> based on the data doesn't doesn't promote satiety mm-hmm. so you know it's i think we've all been on a learning journey well, myself included and yeah that's why yeah. people the butter chuggers that's why people on a ketogenic diet can definitely get fat or stay fat mm. it's you're overeating energy it's yeah it's it's not just insulin because if it was just insulin then you you could eat all the fat you want and not get fat totally. it, you can't overeat fat and there's another if you're already high fat then all you need is low carb <laughs> it's another it's a name yeah and I like that too. Is you just have to not overeat your energy source, whatever it is. And that's why I don't want to be super dogmatic about low carb is the only way to do it. It's what it's going to work for you to not overeat your yeah. fuel source. And so we know if you're mixing them, then it's really hard to not overeat. You're, so unless you're Denise Binger and eating this sort of weird diet that I don't think is very palatable for most people, then it's probably hard to do the high carb version or just with the modern foods. Yeah. Like it works if you're out in the eating like an ancestral diet, like not westernized cultures because that's all they have and it's delicious and they're whole foods and and they're not hyper palatable. So yeah, basically saying that to not overeat your fuel source, I think that a lot of people would do better on the low carb diet. Yeah. yeah. And like you say, not many people are successfully having a high carb diet because they tend towards that hyper palatable middle zone. And um, if you're on a high carb diet, nutrient density is still really relevant. You need to find the most nutrient dense high carb diet foods. And if you choose to go vegan, Denise Minga talks about not just pescatarian, but um, eating mollusks, the bivalve vegan approach, which is going, okay, the, the mollusks aren't sentient, so I can eat them. And they give you a lot of B12 and iodine and omega-3 and really help supplement that plant-based diet. You can get a a good outcome, not a great, not the best outcome, but you can still get an outcome you can do okay off if you go with that sort of approach. Yeah, yeah. So talk about the personal fat threshold and then how can someone be thin on the outside and fat on the inside? Yeah, yeah. Another key concept that's really powerful that I've learned a lot sharing with Ted Naiman and, and Mike Julian and those sort of people. Yeah, so the personal fat threshold is the point at which your adipose tissue says, okay, no more, I can't hold anymore. So you can, you don't hold much protein, you can hold a bit of carbohydrate as glycogen in your liver and muscles and blood, but we can store pretty much unlimited fat storage in our adipose tissue, but you do get to a point where your adipose tissue says, okay, I can't fit any more in, I'm full. And then all that energy, all the excess energy starts to back up in the system and we get elevated blood sugars and all the excess energy goes into our liver and brain and heart and lungs and we get all the metabolic diseases that we're facing. But it's a personal fat threshold that they talk about. Professor Roy Taylor did this interesting work and coined the term of personal fat threshold where he saw people getting fatty livers, fat overflowing back into the vital organs at a a different point depending on genetics or whatever it was like you see some of these islander people they can store a massive amount of fat before they get diabetic Mm -hmm. some other people don't have that luxury and they get elevated blood sugars way before they get a massive amount of fat on them and you know I don't know why that is. Is it toxins or genetics or environment or light environment or cicada? I don't know. Nobody can mm-hmm. really put a finger on why it's different particularly. But, yeah, there does seem to be different points where, you know, you see those really lipodystrophy type people who are very, very, very skinny but they've got massively elevated blood sugars because their fat just can't keep holding any more energy. So the it's a real paradigm shift in understanding of diabetes and metabolic disease. You just have to find a way to improve satiety so you're not filling up your adipose tissue to the point that you get elevated blood sugar. So Mm -hmm. it's a really profound and really enlightening paradigm shift for me that I've got my head around over the last few months and tried to share that out there. Yeah, I like it. And how do people, well, aside from genetic factors, how do people not become thin on the outside, fat on the inside? I mean, is that because they ate like a high fructose or like just really a really bad diet that kept them? I'm always trying to figure out how did they stay thin, but still have all that fat around their liver, right? That's where they still have this bad fat around their liver and organs. Yeah, as I said, it's hard to know exactly why different people store fat in different ways. Um, Is it just genetics or or whatever it is? But it's definitely dangerous once you see that point 
Um, your blood sugar's rising, getting fatty liver, your, your liver enzyme markers start to disintegrate. That's a real sign that you need to take action and everybody would do well to keep an eye on their blood sugars if they start to see them drift anywhere above optimal to take evasive action and try to find a way to maximise satiety as the bottom line to reduce their fat levels to the point that your body fat can take in energy and, and give it back easily without becoming inflamed and puffy and you know it's not a good look to have inflamed fat to the point that it can't hold the excess energy yeah hyperinsulinemia is caused by overfilled and inflamed fat cells right and mm. and mm. what so they get they get to the point that and you've just got so much fat in storage that you have to elevate insulin more and more and more so it's not really the food as much as the the body fat that you've accumulated that isn't able to be held in in storage anymore yeah try to explain the dam just one more time or maybe in a, <laughs> it's just hard to visualize but yeah it's, it's a really important concept and um the dam is just that that the insulin is holding back your your fat in your in your storage so to reduce the fat which is the water on the side of the dam you just need to uh which also reduces insulin and everything you just need to find a way to eat less and put in less in the input so if you if you've got a lot of inflow into a dam it's going to build up and up and up and that dam wall has to grow more and more and more which is your uh, liver trying to hold back the flow of energy out of your fat storage so the way to stop that is to either exercise more which is really hard to do without triggering a whole lot of mm -hmm. appetite or just find a way to eat that allows you to be more satiated and reduce the inflow into your fat stores it's basically, bottom line is it comes down to calories in, calories out, but it, th there's more intelligent ways to hack it by manipulating your diet to maximize the time. Yeah, but how? It's not just focusing. The how is more important it's not just than just explaining. Yeah, it's yeah. Just stating totally. calories in, calories out. Yeah. Yeah, and every, because, oh, people hate hearing calories in, calories out because it just doesn't work. And because if you're just eating that hyperpalatable diet of starch plus fat, then you can't control your appetite. But if you can manipulate your diet to maximize satiety, then insulin and everything else just looks after itself. Yeah, and then so with your wife, there was the insulin, the bolus from eating food, and then the mm. basal, which is like the baseline, right? Mm. So that was interesting to me is if you're eating okay. why a, a low-carb diet is good for type 1 diabetics is because it lowered both she have their insulin yeah and the, the the great thing about a low carb diet for people with diabetes is it enables them to stabilize their blood sugars so your appetite is driven um, if you've dosed with a whole lot of insulin you dose too much insulin it's really hard to match perfectly your insulin dosing and the food you eat if those two things are really large but dr bernstein talks about the law of small numbers where if you've got small amounts of carbohydrate and small amounts of insulin you need to dose you, you're much more likely to get those matched and you're less likely to be on this roller coaster that's going to drive your appetite so the more accurately you can get those doses the better control of your appetite you're going to have and the more stable your blood sugars are going to be and and her quality of life has just radically changed by stabilizing her blood sugars overall. Mm -hmm. um, there's also some information on how to keep that basal insulin low, right? Exercise, you mentioned, but the correct kind yeah. of exercise, which is I suppose resistance, resistance training, training and training hit. Is the ideal. Yeah. yeah, high intensity training. Yeah, to, 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 of... build, to build your lean muscle mass, and which will be able to burn the energy you eat really easily. Maintaining that, Ted always talks about maintaining lean muscle mass. And, uh, you know, if you've, if you've got no lean muscle mass, it, you have to really cut your calories really, really miserably low to survive and not be gaining weight. But if you build muscle mass, you can enjoy a nice amount of food, but, um, yeah, not have to cut it right, right down. Yeah, exactly. Building muscle is great for longevity too, and it's great for, in a way, it raises your metabolism so that you can eat more. And mm. fasting... So yeah, yeah, there's four: exercise, fasting, low energy diet, high nutrient diet. But but fasting fasting alone is uh, you know uh, I've I've tried extended fasting. And you always find a way at that point when you've fasted for a period. If you don't uh, manage your food quality really well, you'll just reach for the ice. My, my I was a sucker for the peanut butter and cream, and you just mm. find yourself just eating until you felt better again. So you, well, you've got to find a way that you're not going to be overeating when you stuff. finish your fast. Well, I don't think I don't believe in like long fasts. Yeah, because then you're just going to end up super mm. hungry. But if you do the more intermittent fast. Okay. 
the longest you could go is like say 16 hours, then you're not mm. going to go crazy. Totally. totally. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. The, the, the MyFitnessPal data also indicates that that early time restricted feeding seems to be beneficial. You start the day with a solid bolus of protein and you're more satiated and you're less likely to sit there in front of the TV binging yeah. on chips or whatever it is later in the day. Yeah. I like that. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of stuff, and I think some of it would be easier just to see visually or people to go read for themselves. So definitely go to OptimizingNutrition.com, check out his blog posts, and then you also have a tool called Nutrient Optimizer. Yeah, we've got a little toy, um, the Nutrient Optimizer that we're developing. There's a bunch of free tools. Um, we've developed the Never Hungry Diet, which is a, a tool that you can download on your app and uh, on your phone and as an app and go through the supermarket and dial up your food and say what's the satiety score, the nutrient density score, and the insulin load score to help you stabilize your blood sugar. So that'll hopefully help people to navigate the supermarket, make better food choices, and potentially just continue to, to ramp up the quality of their diet. And we're developing that into a more more robust, complete tool. As I said before, it'll help develop habits and track your food and tweak your macros and tweak your micros as well to identify the, the nutrients you're not currently getting enough of and the foods that will fill those micronutrient gaps. That's awesome. Yeah, I really like it. Mm. I checked it out and it's cool how you, it optimizes it for you. It shows you what nutrients you're lacking at the top so you can mm. constantly be focusing on those. So it's like this constant updating mm. of what you should be eating. It's really cool. Yeah. just takes you on a journey to continue to refine your diet because you don't start out with an amazing diet. It's just, as we said, it's building habits, building positive habits and refining your food choices. And you won't do it all in the first week. You'll just continue to refine it. And this is the tool that gives you a, a definitive, clear process for doing that. I suppose I was frustrated and angry to see that, you know, so much lack of real useful nutrient advice. And I think you've gone through the same journey that it's just, it just makes you angry just to see people <laughs> floundering and not knowing what to eat. And there's so much conflict of interest and ethical bias and belief all coming into nutrition. And, you know, we just want to know what will help you get the nutrients you need, stabilize your blood sugars if you're trying to manage diabetes and hopefully not eat less if uh, if you're trying to lose fat and maybe a lower satiety diet if you're trying to eat more to uh, to perform a lot of exercise and recover. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess so. If you have that need, it's all context, I guess. All this diet stuff mm. is on, yeah, your yeah. individual totally. preferences, your goals, yeah. everything. So you try to say, what is the perfect diet for the individual? And it's like, well, mm -hmm. you know, humans are different. Our, what we what we do, how we sleep, our activity levels, what we've got available to us is it varies. So you know, how do you take that and optimize it and give people a system to optimize the diet? Is what we're trying to achieve. I love it. Absolutely love it. And I know you're off to low carb down under and you're going to do a presentation mm. on, on satiety. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really excited to be able to talk about satiety. And I've done a few of these presentations before and it's a really good opportunity just to, to get a message and get it out there. And uh, unfortunately, generally, like I've got a year's worth of thinking, waking up early and writing blog <laughs> posts and I've got a year to stick into 20 minutes. But uh, yeah, it's fun. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. I wish I could see it. Maybe it'll be online. Yeah, it'll be on YouTube in a few months. So yeah, looking forward to that satiety message getting out in a digestible format because not everybody wants the long form blog posts and you know, podcasts are great. And yeah, hopefully we'll branch off into doing educational stuff on YouTube in the future. Awesome. I look forward to it. Well, good luck. And I will hopefully be keeping in touch with you and maybe you could help out with some of this stuff for the film. That'd be great. That'd be great. Real privilege and real pleasure to chat to you, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. Cheers. Thanks, Ben. There it is, folks. Check out his website and apps. They're great. Help us down this final stretch raising money for the Food Lies film. There's only 11 days left. Pre-order a copy on any go, go and get it a couple months early. Please tap the five stars on the Apple Podcast app if you feel so inclined. Might be the easiest way to support us. Stay healthy, my friends. 